law enforcement and intelligence agencies to prepare a review of how the administration should fight terrorism. My last on media reporter just wrote a lengthy piece explaining that the white supremacy they're so concerned about is coming from inside the house. Quote, NPR struggles to retain high-profile journalists of color. Hosts have complained to the network's leadership of pay disparities along racial and gender lines. Well, that sounds systemic and weird considering 99% of NPR's programming is about promoting equity. So what's going on here? Well, to investigate, we listened to many more hours of NPR. Here's part of what we heard. So diet culture is this overarching system of beliefs and values that's really endemic to Western culture at this point in history. Christy Harrison is an anti-diet registered dietitian with a master's in public health. <laughs> so there was an anti-diet dietitian. Then, when we kept listening, we were introduced to a fitness expert who hates fitness. Listen. I was and still am in a lot of ways triggered by hearing the word fitness because even before you kind of get engrossed in fitness culture, you are inundated into diet culture and some of the toxic messages. There is a growing movement to make fitness culture a more inclusive one. Ilya Parker is a leading voice in that effort. In fact, that was Ilya's voice you heard talking about how fitness is a trigger word. Ilya is a physical therapist assistant, a certified medical exercise specialist, and the owner of Decolonizing Fitness. So here we have a fat fitness constructor, and that's okay. I'm trying to figure out why is NPR collapsing exactly? I mean, it's kind of baffling, so we kept listening. Then we learned, according to NPR, that if you're going to decolonize fitness, that means you can't let the doctor weigh you because scales are relics of colonialism and white supremacy. If you're going to your doctor, one thing is that you do not have to be weighed. It is your right to decline to be weighed. And so that you certainly can decline when you go. The other thing is to let your provider know that you would like medical care from a health at every size perspective and that you would not uh, want to discuss weight or weight management at your visit, that you have the right to ask for that. <laughs> we should tell you that all these clips are, are from just one episode that aired last week. So now we know why all these people are leaving NPR. It's not racism, they're just embarrassed, but not us. We're no longer going to criticize NPR. We're fans. We're going to keep listening. Nothing like this has ever appeared on the airwaves anywhere. It's hilarious. Treat yourself. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else. Calling on the party to support Hillary Clinton for president in 2024. Hillary is the best position candidate to win a national election, they argued. She's also, they noted, younger than Joe Biden. Former President Bill Clinton agrees with this, or says he does anyway. Bill Clinton told People magazine that his wife is, quote, the most qualified person to run for office in my lifetime, including me. In fact, failing to elect Hillary in 2016 was, in Bill Clinton's studied estimation, an historic national tragedy, quote, one of the most profound mistakes we've ever made. Unforgivable, really. The good news is, we now have a chance to correct that mistake. And you don't get those very often in life. Typically, when you do something rash or stupid, you've got to live with the consequences. It's probably happened to you. One night, you're listening to Born to Run after too many drinks. The next thing you know, you've got Bruce Springsteen's face tattooed on your lower back. It's embarrassing. It's also permanent. Think of Hillary Clinton as America's national tattoo remover. She alone can erase the stain of our youthful bad judgment. God bless that woman. But wait a second, you say. Hillary can't win. She's yesterday's candidate. This country's got a short attention span. We want the new, new thing. And Hillary Clinton isn't new. She's been around forever. We're bored of her. Well, if you believe that, you don't remember Hillary Clinton very well. Call her what you will, but she's not boring. Hillary's like a box of Cracker Jacks or your emotionally volatile niece who goes to art school. She's full of surprises. You never know what you're going to get. There are days when Hillary seems like a sensible Midwestern Methodist who grew up Republican in a suburb outside Chicago. That's the biographically accurate Hillary Clinton. But it's hardly the only Hillary Clinton. During the years she spent in Arkansas, for example, Hillary often played the loyal daughter of the American South, a Southern fried Dixie lady with a spunky feminist twist. That was the character she was portraying when we first met her 30 years ago this month. It was during the 1992 presidential primaries. Listen to her accent here. 
she did in the North African nation of Libya. It's the one achievement of her life that's uniquely hers. Her husband had nothing to do with it. As Secretary of State under Obama, Hillary Clinton ordered the killing of Muammar Gaddafi. He was the bloodthirsty Libyan strongman who was also, let's be honest, creepy and weird and therefore deserving of death. Hillary had him offed. Then she laughed about it. Watch. That is the land of unconfirmed We came, we saw, we died. <laughs> We came, we saw, he died. Pretty funny. But then what happened? Once Hillary killed the leader of the country, how'd the country do? Well, let's see. We'll tell the story in pictures. Here's the capital of Libya before Hillary Clinton decided to introduce the Libyan people to a little thing we call human rights. The city looks fine. <laughs> right. But underneath, there was no freedom. There were too few Soros back NGOs. She changed that. Now, here's that same city, post Hillary. Those people in the foreground are African slaves. They're being sold as property in the now thriving slave markets in downtown Tripoli. No, they don't look very happy, that's true. But at least Gaddafi's gone, so on some level, they're free. They've been liberated by Hillary Clinton, despite the fact they're not a slave. That's called progress. It's worth something. In fact, it's a pretty good campaign slogan. Hillary 2024, she'll do for us what she did for Libya. You can imagine the posters and t-shirts and coffee mugs. Somebody's going to need to get those slaves to sign a consent form. Put that on the list. But all of a sudden, Hillary Clinton for president is starting to sound a little less crazy, isn't it? In fact, it's starting to sound inevitable. There are really just two questions left to answer. Why did Hillary lose last time? And who would she run against two years from now? Let's take the first question first. It's got the simplest, most obvious answer. 
Hillary Clinton was cheated out of her rightful destiny in 2016 because unseen forces of evil worked furiously to undermine her because they feared her strength and goodness. Come on, you knew that. Hillary Clinton certainly knows that. Watch. The Russians, let's say WikiLeaks, same thing, dumped <laughs> the John Podesta emails. I have my uh, complaints about uh, former director Comey. The use of uh, my email account was uh, turned into, you know, the biggest scandal since Lord knows when. They covered it like it was Pearl Harbor. If you look at Facebook, uh, the vast majority of the news news items posted were fake. There's all these stories about, you know, guys over in Macedonia who are running these fake news sites. I inherit nothing from the Democratic Party. I also think I was the victim of a very broad assumption I was going to win. You know, if the election went on October 27th, I'd be your president. And it wasn't. It was on October 28th, and there was just a lot of funny business going on around that. So the Russians, WikiLeaks, Jim Comey, Facebook, Democratic Party saboteurs, and the citizenry of Macedonia. Those are the people who did the funny business that was like Pearl Harbor that prevented Hillary from becoming president. That's who opposed her last time, obviously. Who's going to oppose her this time? Well, for the answer to that question, we turn, as we always do, to Mr. Tom Friedman of the New York Times, who is both a Pulitzer Prize winner and a certified moron. In that paradoxical way that's familiar to Washingtonians, Tom Friedman is just dumb enough to get a lot of things right. If Tom Friedman thinks it, chances are a lot of other self-important mediocrities think it too. And those are the people who run this country. Yesterday, Tom Friedman wrote a piece calling on Joe Biden to replace Kamala Harris with Liz Cheney in the next election. Now, if you're not Tom Friedman or his friends, this might strike you as ridiculous. In fact, it might seem like yet another sign that our political class has reached peak decadence and exhaustion. If they're pushing a Cheney in the next presidential cycle, Oops. maybe they've run out of ideas. Well, of course they have. And that's exactly what gives Hillary such a natural opening here. As long as we're turning our politics into a 1990s sitcom reunion, why not get George W. Bush to run? It's not a crazy idea. He's got the time to do it. At this stage, Bush would much rather run with Hillary than against Hillary, their personal friends on most things they agree vehemently. But having a Bush and a Clinton on the same ticket wouldn't work. It's just too obvious. Maybe W could be convinced to take one for the establishment and throw on the Republican jersey one last time. He's 75, but that is a full presidential term younger than Joe Biden, which by current standards qualifies as fresh new leadership. George W, 2024, time to give the younger generation a chance. It might work, or not, just spitballing here. Either way, it is way past time to get Hillary back into the White House. The lady's got a speech to give. She wrote it five years ago for her inevitable inauguration, thanks to the Macedonians that didn't happen. But she never threw it away. She still got the speech. Last month, she read a portion of it on NBC News. Watch. I dream of going up to her and sitting down next to her, taking her in my arms and saying, look at me. Listen to me. You will survive. You will have a good family of your own and three children. And as hard as it might be to imagine, your daughter will grow up and become the president of the United States. Who's she crying for? Herself. In case you're confused by the context there, that was Hillary telling her deceased mother that everything's going to be okay because Hillary has been elected president of the United States. No more tears, no more anxiety. We're going to make it. We've got a woman in the White House. A lot's happened since Hillary Clinton wrote those words. It's a different country now than it was five years ago. But Hillary Clinton hasn't changed. Her primary interests remain exactly what they always were. She's still talking with endless and undimmed birthday. Yes, yeah, it's corn pop. It's just hyperbole. And that's why they have to keep saying it. I mean, no one needed convincing that 9-11 was bad a year later. For January 6th, however, never forget means we all literally would forget unless we make a big deal out of it every year. So now it's January 6th every day as Republicans engage in extreme attacks on our most basic constitutional right, voting. Which is why now Joe pushes a filibuster carve-out, which sounds like a new entree at Boston Market. Dad would know. But now you see the point of the January 6th anniversary. The Dems need an emergency to change voting rules. It's 2020 all over again. 
And like a serial killer's dog, the media happily played along, joining in on the hysterical messaging. Yes, the messaging. That's what it's all about these days. Gee, I wonder, is the media out of touch with people? A lot of the media does seem, when I look at it and, and then travel the country, to be very out of touch with people. If you travel the country, people are not really living in the same uh, bubble that it seems that uh, most of the media is messaging toward. I think this is an issue because if people are tuning out uh, what's going on in cable news, if we're not messaging toward uh, the general population, um, you know, they're, they're just, you know, ignoring everything and, and living their lives uh, and, and we're not really getting the information that they need to them. Look at that. That's some hairless on hairless action. One more egg and we could have made an omelet. Oh my God, CNN frets. They don't live in the same bubble as we do. Americans are tuning out, ignoring everything. They're going outside and talking to people. Some of them are actually smiling. Yeah, Americans are living their lives and not listening to you, you freaks. And CNN just found out now? Haven't they seen their ratings? Were they too small to see at this point? Also, do you really believe this hack travels outside the bubble? I bet his idea of seeing the country is grabbing a connecting flight to Charlotte. But this is good news. The messaging isn't working. No one listens to CNN's conveyor belt of lies, which makes sense. Consider the sources. Chris Cuomo, Don Lemon, a guy who ate human brains, a lady who eats crickets on purpose. Let's not forget Tubin. We've been there. And now there's John Griffin, the longtime CNN producer and alleged child trafficker who's been named in a civil lawsuit alleging despicable acts of horrific sexual abuse. Between April and July 2020, Griffin allegedly invited three women and their underage daughters over for the purposes of sexual training. And that's according to the latest federal indictment. Yeah, who knew CNN had its own in-house Jeffrey Epstein? And given the time frame, it seems like he was also violating lockdown orders. There's the real outrage. I wonder what's on CNN now. It's ridiculous to say that we're out of touch. Yeah, I'm out of touch because my pet iguana goes to private school? Come on. Yeah, we know what's going on, all right? I know what the Six Flags is. Yeah, when Y2K hits, I'll be ready. I tip my Guatemalan butler every time he brushes my teeth. Yeah, I mean, I unadopted my one-year-old son because he couldn't spell Green New Deal. And I always give thumbs up to homeless people. I mean, even in the winter, when my thumb gets a little cold. You are an inspiration. You should be on Good Morning America. Mm. <laughs> That's an interesting point. So, so forgive us, CNN, if Americans don't really want any part of your messaging. You're kind of creeping us out at this point. You're the cable version of the guy who hangs out at the playground but didn't bring any kids. And when you ask him why he's there, he says something like, Hey, I've always been fascinated by the monkey bars. Oh. Then you ask him which kid is his, and he says, I wish they all were. <laughs> Maybe that's why CNN was so wrong on Kyle Rittenhouse, because by 17, they've lost interest. <laughs> <laughs> but it's more than just their personnel. It's their hysteria, conflict-based profit model. January 6th was just one example. While CNN and others gushed endlessly about their own PTSD, the rest of America was like, what? It's the same reliable hysteria they applied to collusion, Covington, Kavanaugh. Remember the classics? That perfect phone call was worse than Watergate. Climate change means the Earth dies in eight years. January 6th is Pearl Harbor all over again. You see the disconnect between them and you. And it's this gulf between their claims and actual reality that mirrors exactly the gulf between the press and the public they don't understand. And if you listen to CNN, well, it's got to be America's fault even though they've been so insanely wrong on everything, from COVID to crime. The last time they were right, Wolf Blitzer was a mere pup. But you know, maybe CNN should be grateful no one is really paying attention to them, because if America did, imagine what else they'd find. News that we just got out of the Supreme Court. Uh, Jonathan, if you're with us, Professor, can you weigh in on what we've just gotten from the court halting the COVID-19 vaccine rule for U.S. businesses? now what does all this mean well this is what some of us predicted after the oral argument i was struck by the different uh tone and substance of the questions being raised by the conservatives between the two cases on the health facility case this way justices acknowledged that there was a closer nexus there and did not it, it seriously push back on the larger mandate it's really the osha case that is the more significant mandate for 
uh, the Biden administration. It was that mandate that President Biden's chief of staff, Ron Klain, uh, celebrated as a, quote, workaround. Uh, the White House could not get a mandate from Congress. Uh, they initially said that they thought they might have authority for the president to order a mandate, and then they acknowledged they did not. And then Klain uh, retweeted that we found a workaround. We'll have OSHA do it. And this could affect up to 100 million workers. Well, a flag was just thrown on the play. I mean, the Supreme Court justices continually asked for the authority that was being used here. And they referenced Ron Klain's statement. Mm. As I said before, the, the justices are not into workarounds, you know, because it's a workaround constitutional authority. They want authority. And they kept on coming back and saying, where did you find this authority? Why isn't this a question for Congress to have ordered, not for some agency to do a workaround? Yeah, not, not, not surprisingly, Jonathan Justice Breyer uh, in the purview of the Supreme Court and the courts to, uh, to rule on this. Well, they certainly made no secret of that during the oral argument. What I think they're going to get some pushback on is that all three justices made statements about the pandemic that were heavily criticized in terms of their factual understanding of where we are in terms of cases and, and the virus. And, of course, Justice Sotomayor was the one who was most criticized for giving a number that was 20 to 30 times higher in terms of the effect, this impact on children. And so I think that really did undermine them a bit. But I also have to say in fairness to them, these are three justices that have always been highly deferential to agencies. They're big supporters of a thing called the Chevron Doctrine. And so this is consistent. This is not activism. This goes to the heart of their their view of jurisprudence. They believe strongly that you should defer to federal agencies. Multiple <clears throat> developing stories, including Dr. Fauci's pathetic meltdown on Capitol Hill today. We'll play all the lowlights of that coming up, and Senator Ted Cruz will join us with a more chilling story about the FBI in January the 6th. Uh, earlier today, he just brutalized an FBI spokesperson. We'll play you that tape. But first, we begin with Democratic activist Stacey Abrams. As you all know, Stacey Abrams still believes that she is the rightful governor of Georgia, that she thinks she won in 2018 after losing well, by nearly two points in Georgia's gubernatorial race. She never conceded, claiming voter suppression despite no evidence. And now she's running for what she believes is her re-election. And naturally, the Democrats' so-called voting rights legislation is one of her top issues. But today, when Joe Biden and Kamala Harris made a special trip to Stacey Abrams' hometown to tout this new legislation, Stacey Abrams was nowhere to be found. Apparently, it was some kind of uh, scheduling conflict. That's what we'll call it. Take a look. I spoke to Stacey this morning at a great relationship. We got our scheduling mixed up. I'm going to be, I talked with her at lunch this morning. We're all on the same page, and uh, everything's fine. Okay, pretty humiliating, a scheduling conflict. Now, is it perhaps <laughs> that Joe Biden's poll numbers are so bad, Stacey Abrams refused to appear with the president and vice president of the United States, or even meet with him behind closed doors and can't even be bothered to come up with a halfway, well, decent excuse. This is a pretty low point for Joe and Kamala, who are officially now toxic, even among members in their own party. Make no mistake, Biden's so-called voting rights legislation is also incredibly toxic and unconstitutional. Now, I spoke to Stacey this morning at a great relationship. We got our scheduling mixed up. I'm going to be, I talked with her lunch this morning. We're all the same page, and everything's fine. President Biden insisted he and Stacey Abrams are still on the same team, despite the nation's most prominent liberal voting rights activist's absence from his speech. Yeah, Joe Concha is joining us live on this uh, interesting turn of events. That must have been some scheduling conflict, Joe, that Stacey Abrams was up against. 
Yeah, and Shimki, welcome back, by the way. We haven't seen each other for a while. I think even though we're 12 days in, we could say Happy New Year. So Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. Good to see you. <laughs> I, I, I wrote about this in a column for, for The Hill yesterday. Uh, this is pretty easy. When the president and the vice president of the United States come to your state to push your signature issue, if you're Stacey Abrams, you clear your schedule. Of course, we never heard exactly what was on Ms. Abrams' schedule that forced her into hiding yesterday, save for a few meaningless tweets. And it shows you two things. One, how toxic the president is to Democrats right now in Georgia, a state that he actually won in 2020 very narrowly. Uh, Mr. Biden is now firmly underwater and polling more voters to disapprove of his performance there than approving we're not even one year in. And two, it also shows you exactly how little confidence at this point Democrats have in Mr. Biden's ability to get this voting legislation over the finish line at this point. You can see now there is desperation within this White House because look at the priorities, right? Totally tone deaf. First, they focus on Build Back Better amid skyrocketing inflation and crime and the border being open and education going sideways, uh, all while saying, you know, with Build Back Better, it's going to, you know, add zero dollars to the deficit in Wallace. <laughs> the deficit, right, the, the whole whispering thing. And, and, and that's dead right now, right? Then this year they pivot to January 6th. Now the focus is on voting rights, an issue that is way down the ladder of priorities for the American people. And to Sean Duffy's point, if there is a massive number of people who want to vote but can't, I believe they would be all over TV or marching in the streets. Yep. Those people don't exist. It's the biggest non-issue of our time, Todd. Absolutely. From a whisper to a slam, here's Ted Cruz versus a podium. Watch. <laughs> Just once, I'd like to so the full of shit, to man. Joe Biden when he stands at the damn podium. Oh, he's so White full of shit. You just the called freaking Americans terrorists the other day, liar. Are only directed at one side, and I kind of say the American Ted Cruz is fucking not a liar. I mean, it's such a good point by Ted Cruz right there. It oh, yeah. Good Real good point. That Pretend that you're mad. Will anything ever change? Of course not. And I've always wondered about this as well, to the Senator Cruz's point. Why does Jen Psaki, for example, wear a mask or doesn't wear a mask in the White House press briefings, right? And, and I don't know if you've ever been to the, to the James Brady briefing room. Uh, it used to be a place where they had an indoor uh, pool there. It's profoundly small, low ceilings. Everybody's on top of each other. Basically, it's perfect for COVID. And yet, reporters all have to wear masks, but the press secretary does not. And she got COVID despite being vaxxed and boosted a couple of weeks ago. So the same goes for the president, who will wear a mask nowhere within 500 feet of anybody on a beach alone in Delaware. But then if reporters <laughs> want to talk to him, he'll walk up to him, take off the mask, and then mm -hmm. two feet talk to him and then put the thing back on. Everybody's tired of this, obviously, at this point. And yes, only one party appears to be being called out on it, guys. Yeah, and the reason he was all fired, Ted Cruz was all fired up yesterday is because he was making a speech or he was, you know, making a comment about ending the filibuster and a reporter asked him why he wasn't wearing a mask and then you saw him slamming the podium. Luckily, no podiums were hurt in the making of this segment, Joe Thank you for joining us this morning. You haven't lost your fastball, Shed. Good job. Uh, Love it. Oh, you Keeps going. You All right, we'll talk to you later, Joe. Have a good one. now gearing up for what's being billed as a dramatic speech on voting rights. But as one critic pointed out with COVID crime and the nation's economic troubles, are voting rights really the biggest issue now facing Americans? Hmm. I'm Kaylee McVinney, and this is Outnumbered. I'm joined by my co-host, Harris Faulkner. The president is pivoting, or some would say President Biden is deflecting as he focuses today on voting rights. But even as he tries to present a united front among his party on this issue, he's facing some trouble. With high-profile voting leaders planning to be no-shows today, like Stacey Abrams, who is citing a scheduling conflict, as well as others who are di dismissing today's address as being too little, too late. The former head of the NAACP saying, quote, we do not need any more speeches, we do not need any more platitudes, we need action. But the White House still sees Georgia as ground zero in its push for a federal takeover of U.S. elections. As the president has been railing for months now 
against the state's new voting rules, calling them racist and a threat to democracy. Watch. Makes Jim Crow look like Jim Eagle. I do everything in my power, along with my friends in the House and the Senate, to keep that from, uh, from becoming a law. This is Jim Crow on steroids, what they're doing in, in Georgia and 40 other states. These new Jim Crow laws are just antithetical to who we are. The other side to it, too, is when they, in fact, move out of Georgia, the people who need the help the most, people who are making hourly wages, sometimes get hurt the most. Emily, he has been fact-checked on that by none other than the liberal Washington Post who gave him four Pinocchios. Take us through the Georgia voting law and the lies of the president. I am happy to do so, Kaylee. So, you guys, on election day in Georgia, polling places are open from 7 to 7, and if you are in line by 7 p.m., you're allowed to cast your ballot. Nothing in that new law changed those rules. Now, the law did make some changes to early voting, but those expanded opportunities to vote, especially in rural counties. It didn't limit them. And you know where Biden gets his lie about 5 p.m. from? The law used to say that early voting shall be conducted during normal business hours, right? And the new law specifies, okay, nine to five. Now that change was made because some rural county election officials only worked part-time during the full week, not a full eight hour day. So the shift to more specific times made it clear that they must be open every day for at least eight hours. Mm -hmm. And the law also allows counties to set the hours anywhere between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. So the practical effect of the 5 p.m. reference is honestly minimal. And the law reduced the early voting period, yes, in weeks before runoff elections. But this was to cut down on the number of ballots that were rejected for coming in late because of the tight turnaround. You know, Biden makes it seem like this was an attack on working Americans, that this law, to use his words, ends voting at 5 o'clock when working people are just getting off work or ends voting hours early so working people can't cast their vote after their shift is over. And he was making it seem like that was voting on election day, not early voting. Election day hours, again, were not changed. So for the lies that the president continues to spread, as you pointed out, Kaylee, even the Washington Post assigned him four Pinocchios, their highest grade for a lie reserved for whoppers. It's amazing. Those are the facts. Um, it'll be interesting to see if the president repeats those falsehoods and if the media fact checks him on that. Harris, interestingly, when you go over to polling, it's really curious why Biden's making this his top issue because voters don't see it as a top issue. I mean, if you look at the top three issues, it's the economy at 68 percent, according to the AP, COVID-19, 37 percent, immigration, 32 percent. In fact, when Gallup did the issues most important to voters, there was an asterisk by the issue of voting, meaning it didn't even register as statistically significant. Also curious, when you look at 2020 versus 2016, actually the share of those showing up to vote, non-Hispanic Asians, expanded from 59% from 49% in the previous election. Non-Hispanic whites, look at these numbers, 71% showed up versus 65. We had record turnout in 2020, so why is this the issue? Well, I, I think the White House needs to learn the actual meaning of current <coughs> events. They, they didn't want to talk about Afghanistan when it was blowing apart based on policy and decisions of the current president back in late August, early September. They pivoted, remember? And they pivoted to something that didn't help us in the long run, because if they'd been sincerely pivoting to COVID, we might have had more tests. They may have seen that manufacturers had slowed down since the previous May and making testing available to Americans. They, they might have seen that, but they weren't sincere in that pivot. And now they're doing it again. Now the challenge is COVID-19. And this is a sincere pivot, I suppose, if they could actually win on this issue. But it's complicated because the Major League Baseball All-Star Game moved from Georgia to Colorado, and then when it did, Democrats like Stacey Abrams, the former gubernatorial candidate who failed, realized, oh my goodness, that hurts black communities because all that money was coming in from the MLB and Colorado has tighter early voting standards and restrictions than Georgia. Uh-oh, somebody didn't do their homework. Exactly. So we'll see how the pivot works out this time. Yeah, I'll be watching. I mean, how is this pivot going to work out? Incredibly, uh, amazingly, Democrat groups are not showing up who support voting rights 
Juan, including Stacey Abrams. And President Biden was asked about Stacey Abrams not showing up to this big speech he has built. Take a listen to what he said. Are you insulted? She's skipping the speech? I'm insulted to ask the question. Oh, I spoke to Stacy this morning. We had a great relationship. We got our scheduling mixed up. I'm going to be, I talked to her this morning. We're all on the same page. And uh, everything's fine. A scheduling conflict, Juan. The President of the United States, the Commander in Chief in your own party, by the way, is coming to your state and you can't move your schedule? Something there just doesn't add up, Juan. Yeah, I would think that she should make time to go to that speech, because I think it's an important speech, not only for Democrats, but I think for Republicans. I think every American should support the idea that, you know, voting is sacrosanct in our democratic society. Everybody should be able to easily vote, and their vote should be equally counted. It shouldn't take two minutes to vote in a rural county, but two hours in the cities and suburbs where you have populations concentrated and lots of minority voters. You know, right now, we have lots of people who still believe Trump's big lie, and as a result, what we've seen is more than 30 states, you know, despite those numbers that you put up about increased turnout in 2020, uh, lots of states now, especially with Republican legislatures, have said, well, we're not trusting in the voting system because President Trump alleged that there was fraud. And so, despite the lack of evidence of any fraud, we're going to change the system. And in some cases, it's more difficult Juan, for the Georgia, mail-in voting, limit I'm not a time, back on that vote because early. Juan, the Georgia voting law, though, I, I assume you don't support that, am I right? I don't, the I mean, Georgia there's voting law? that I don't support in total, especially the idea that the state well, legislature now party, gets to decide who wins the election. Your party, That's Juan, crazy. certainly doesn't... You're, your, your party certainly doesn't support the Georgia voting law, but amazingly, in 2021, so this is after the law passed in the municipal election, turnout rose by 17%. Uh, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution pointing out short lines, few problems, no obstacles at the polls, Carly. This despite Democrats loudly and vociferously saying the Georgia voting law would restrict voting. Yeah. <laughs> And the reason President Biden, Kaylee, is talking about this issue today is because he desperately needs some positive news coverage, and he usually gets it when he talks about election reform from the, from the media, which is 95% uh, liberal. Um, the Biden administration is hoping that his speech today will be his white night moment. There was an excerpt of what he is going to say in his speech that was released earlier today. He's going to say... We will choose democracy over autocracy, light over shadow, justice over injustice. I know where I stand. I will not yield. I will not flinch. I will defend your right to vote. So we're going to hear urgency like we've never heard it before. Some problems about that remark is that this is a problem that doesn't exist. It is easy to vote in this country no matter what state you're in. I know that because I voted in this country. Um, and I've done it without a snack in line and live to talk about it. The other thing is that I think the Biden administration is really blindsided this morning uh, when they woke up to criticism not from Republicans, but from Democrats who say that they haven't gone far enough on this issue. And lastly, and I think this is the most important point, is that I just wonder why President Biden is talking about election reform uh, right now when we're in a midterm election year when this isn't going anywhere unless the filibuster rules change and Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin aren't on board with that so he is going into midterms with uh, build back better laws and quite possibly an election reform loss as well. I wish he felt that way about testing. Yeah, I, yeah. Right, right, exactly. And Harris, that's the point. He's talking about voting because he wants to distract from those three issues. Most important to voters, the economy, COVID-19, immigration, which are all crises on his watch. Hi, Linda Brian Kilmeade. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to click to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page. This is the only way that I know for sure that you're not going to miss any great commentary, any great news bites, any great interviews. Your data is your business. Protect it at expressvpn.com slash Candace. Hello and welcome to 2022 and to season two of Candace. I hope that everyone had a wonderful Christmas break, that the children got all the gifts that they wanted. In my house, we celebrate Boxing Day. 
my husband is English, and that's actually a thing over there. The day after Christmas in the United Kingdom is another bank holiday that's referred to as Boxing Day. It has nothing to do with boxes or even the sport of boxing anymore. Essentially, it's just a day that you spend with neighbors and friends and you eat leftovers. It's kind of like a Christmas hangover. So for our Christmas hangover, we went to a friend's home and got all the kids together. And this particular friend had purchased a pair of Oculus goggles for his son. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Maybe you've seen the pictures. They are a pair of giant goggles that you wear that allows you to play a video game in a sort of virtual reality. That was the pitch, at least, when they first came out. When I tried on these Oculus toggles on Boxing Day, I realized that it was something entirely different. My experience wasn't a very long one, so I put these glasses on, and suddenly I'm transported into an elevator, and it is incredible how real it looks and it feels. And I pressed a button, and I went up in the elevator, and the elevator opens, and I was standing on the top of a building, the tiny little ledge. And I could hear the people around me in the real universe saying, you know, just step out onto the ledge and jump off. <laughs> I'm not jumping off this ledge. There's no way I'm jumping off of this ledge. I mean, I was aware, of course, that in the universe, my, my feet were on the ground. But seeing is believing. So in this reality, I was convinced that I was actually on top of the building and they were asking me to jump and I was terrified. I did not go and jump off. I said, I'm not doing this. I, am not, I don't want to do this. I tried to inch away my way forward and finally I said, nope, I'm taking these off. And they all kind of laughed at me. And then my friend went up next. Pretty much the same process. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. And then my husband thought it would be funny to push my friend. Of course, in the universe, just give him a little push. And my friend fell over onto the floor into the universe and screamed, ah! He was genuinely terrified. He took the glasses off and he said he felt like he was actually dying. Actually thought that he was going to die from this little push. And I thought, wow, someone's actually going to die from a heart attack probably, right? I mean, that's how real everything becomes when you put these goggles on. And the person that was hosting us informed us that you actually have to sign a waiver to play because people have already actually died. Is that for a game? <laughs> now, why am I telling you this? Because what we're talking about and what I experienced was the coming of the metaverse. We've heard about it. Facebook recently changed their name to Meta. I mean, everybody's talking about the metaverse. There was a tract of virtual land that sold for $4.3 million in the metaverse. And guess what? After I's experience, I can tell you that that was actually a good investment. Snoop Dogg, the rapper, has a $17 million NFT collection. That's a virtual art collection. What do you do with virtual art? You're probably asking yourselves, well, you put it in a virtual world, in your virtual house, on a virtual plot of land. The second reason, the more important reason I'm telling you this is because it scared me. It scared me because I felt in my gut that I had stumbled upon a missing piece of this authoritarian puzzle. Think about it. All of the radical changes that we've experienced in society over the last two years, somehow it all just perfectly aligns with the coming of the metaverse. Social distancing. People afraid, genuinely afraid to see one another's faces. Mm -hmm. I mean, what better solve for that than to only communicate with one another via the metaverse? Just throw on a pair of goggles and meet up mm -hmm. virtually. Come to my house. Do you guys see how important world. it is what I'm showing you here, listening to this? National shutdown I hope somebody gets it. To combat COVID. Virtual learning established to combat a virus that has an approximate 0% chance of harming any child. Children it's also why you got to go to the rocks anyway. and the well, stones and the trees and crap like that because it's all going to get sold as a virtual reality. They're going to tell you you're living in a hologram. Put on their goggles they're liars. And, class. and they'll be convinced, by the way, that they are actually in a classroom sitting next to their peers because that's how real it feels behind those goggles. Only this time their parents aren't going to have to worry about any germs. There'll be no need for parents to physically go into work anymore either. Just throw on a pair of goggles and be immediately transported into your office. 
isolation, and more technology. <laughs> what we're talking about, what I'm trying to communicate to you, is that we are on the brink of transhumanism. Human beings are becoming the computers. I want you to think about that the next time you hear words like biotech. No, I want you to think about what I'm showing you is what I want you to go look at. I got to get your names up on the videos real quick. Fused with technology. What we are on the brink of is the next iteration of the World Wide Web, and it should terrify you. So welcome to Web3. Let's talk about your internet security. Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like leaving your laptop exposed at a coffee shop table while you run to the counter to buy another drink. Most of the time you're probably fine, but what if one day you come back and find that your laptop is gone? Every time you connect to an unencrypted network, think cafe, airport, or hotel Wi-Fi, your online data is not secured. Any hacker on the same network can gain access to and steal your personal data. It does not take an advanced techie knowledge to hack someone. Really, a 12-year-old could do it. That's why I recommend ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN creates a secure, encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so that hackers can't steal your sensitive data. What I like most about ExpressVPN is how easy it is to use. Simply download the app on your phone or computer, tap one button, and you're protected. Secure your online data today with the VPN that I trust by visiting expressvpn.com slash Candice. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Candice, and you can get an extra three months free. Thanks for joining me on this segment of Candace. If you'd like President Trump is attacking prominent black Americans. He's just impugned the intelligence of LeBron James and Don Lemon, which echoes the way he singled out the IQ of Congresswoman Maxine Waters or the academic credentials of Barack Obama, attacks that come on the anniversary of the Charlottesville White Power rallies. For tonight's discussion, we're joined by conservative activist Candace Owens. She's with Turning Point USA, and she argues African Americans are doing better under the Trump presidency. She's drawn praise for the way she thinks from none other than Kanye West, who has praised Trump, while the president also hailed her impact and contribution to this dialogue on the.